In 1941, while in hiding during World War II, Walter Benjamin wrote that a clay painting named Angelus Novus shows an angel looking as though he is about to move away from something he is fixedly contemplating. His eyes are staring, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. This is how one pictures the angel of history. His face is turned towards the past. Where we perceive a chain of events, he sees one single catastrophe which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. This storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. In Benjamin's view, we are propelled forward not by hope for the future, which we can never truly know, but by our horror at the atrocities of the past. We cannot go back in time and fix what has been done to our ancestors, so we must instead find the will for change in our desire to avenge them. But what if Benjamin's angel of history suddenly became so horrified at his perception of the present and his trajectory into the future that he gained the will to thrust himself back in time. In M. Night Shyamalan's 2004 film The Village, that's exactly what happens. In The Village, a group of people comes together over their shared inability to cope with grief for their loved ones lost to acts of violence. In the late 1970s, they form a new community modeled after a 19th century town. This community is sort of alien to us. Despite their difficulties in verbal communication, the inhabitants are markedly close in their reliance on each other and their adherence to a set of shared principles. The community values hard work. They seem to all be vegetarians. They care for each other in times of hardship and they more or less unquestioningly defer to authority and agree to keep out of the woods where the scary, bloodthirsty monsters live. There is a sort of coherence of identity here that we would rarely find in our modern-day cities. In forming this community, its founders also completely sequester themselves and their children from the rest of the world, which they feel has become rotten. And that feeling stems from a legitimate phenomenon. In his book Community, Zygmunt Bauman describes three essential features of a community. A community is small, everyone in the community is aware of everyone else. It's distinctive, so there's a clear delineation between members and non-members of the community, it has a beginning and an end, and it's self-sufficient. The community provides for all members with a minimum interaction with non-members. Because of this emphasis on an in-group and an out-group, communities must negotiate a balance between freedom and security. Through their proximity and dependence on each other, community members gain a measure of security, but that same interdependence also puts some restrictions on members' freedoms. Members cannot come and go freely from the communities they are bound to. You have made an oath, Edward as all have never to go back. It's easy to think of this as a scale, where as one side increases, the other decreases, and vice versa. One without the other is useless. Security without freedom would be like a form of slavery, and freedom without security would be kind of like the purge. You have to find the right balance. Ultimately, there are many ways for the dance between freedom and security to resolve. But the Industrial Revolution, Bauman asserts, marked a shift towards increases in freedoms for workers under the guise of a liberal emphasis on individualism, freeing the individual from the inertia of the mass. Under the surface, the real shift was the transformation of the proletariat masses into a productive labor force to prop up the freedoms of the bourgeoisie because, much more so than a community of people, a disconnected collection of individuals is highly modular, so that each worker is easily replaceable. With this new emphasis on individualism, 
successes and failures are increasingly seen not as the progresses and responsibilities of a whole community, but as the strengths and weaknesses of single individuals. As a result of this shift, combined with the increasing telemetry of the modern world, the type of community described by Bauman doesn't really exist anymore. Modernity has fragmented not only the individual subject, but also the clumps that subjects naturally gravitate toward. We can pretty easily see how the new freedoms afforded to individuals come at the expense of the security and welfare that is naturally provided by a community. But increasingly, we can also see how the dissolution of communities has disrupted the stability of our own images of ourselves. No longer able to situate ourselves within the bigger picture of a stable community, our social connections to others become tenuous and mercurial. Our communities today are primarily aesthetic. Our freedom to join and leave them as it conveniences us becomes more important than our commitments to the other members. Think, for example, of the grief counseling group where the elders initially meet in the village. We might think of a therapy group as a sort of community, but what really binds the individual patients to one another? One member's presence might be meaningful and helpful to another member, but once the former is no longer benefiting from the sessions, they are under no obligation to continue attending to support the rest of the group. They may voluntarily choose to do so, but there will be minimal consequences if they do not. Ultimately, in a liberal society, individual freedom is prioritized over collective security, so the communities we form tend to be relatively superficial. In this case, though, the elders of the village were moved to such a vulnerable state that they did become dependent on one another in a way. Because another question that arises in the absence of community is how can we conceive of death in this modern world? In his book The Inoperative Community, Jean-Luc Nancy calls a community a place from which to surmount the unraveling that occurs with the death of each one of us. That death that, when no longer anything more than the death of the individual, carries an unbearable burden and collapses into insignificance. In a genuine community, when a member dies, it feels as though that death is meaningful and the loss is mourned by the whole society. But today, in the words of neoliberal girl boss Margaret Thatcher, there is no such thing as society. There are individual men and women, and there are families. And those families and perhaps some other loved ones might feel the profound impact of the loss of an individual life, but the rest of the world around them will continue to move on and change beyond all recognition. Without a community that will remember us in death and memorialize our spirit through its own continuity, what becomes of us? I think this is the question that troubled the elders of the village when their loved ones fell victim to acts of unnecessary violence. In a world that is constantly adapting and changing, and with no community to lean on, it becomes difficult not only to slow down and grieve, but also to find peace in the concept of one's own death. This struggle with death and grief is not such an exceptional experience. But what does seem to make the elders of the village exceptional is that their impulse is not to just continue processing their grief against the unstoppable forward march of time, but instead to move back in time, into the past, before their loved ones were killed and really before they even had the chance to live. In doing so, they hope to avoid the conditions that caused the untimely deaths to occur in the first place. This movement is marked by a tipping of the scales away from freedom and back towards security. In exchange for the supposed comforts of non-violence and peaceful grieving, the villagers must sacrifice any ability to come and go freely or interact with the outside world at all. This impulse is, of course, reactionary by its very nature. When Edward, a professor of history, looked at the problems of the world around him, he did not try to conceive of a new world wholly disjoined from the struggles of modern life. 
he failed to recognize what Walter Benjamin characterizes as a revolutionary chance. Instead, all he could imagine was a time before some of the debris piled up before the eyes of Benjamin's angel of history. A time when things were still horrible, but a little less horrible than they are now. But we have to ask the question, for whom was the past less horrible? If we're looking, it's not hard to discern that every villager we encounter in the movie, protagonist and background character alike, is white. This is not altogether surprising, it's unlikely that people of color would be so enthusiastic about an ideological return to the time just after the United States had been torn apart because they couldn't agree on whether or not it was okay to enslave black people, and they were still in the process of manifesting their destiny all over lands already inhabited and governed by brown people. But I think it might be too charitable to assert that people of color made their own choice not to join this project. A group of white people voluntarily segregating themselves from people of color, in particular black people, because of concerns about violence, is not really an M. Night Shyamalan twist at all. It's just a gated community. In the real world, lacking the security of a genuine community, people will fall back on surface-level similarities to establish a vague sense of safety from the quote-unquote other. They form aesthetic communities around their perceived sameness and exclude anyone who threatens it. Bauman calls this process voluntary ghettoization. These communities become suffocating because the safer you feel inside, the more dangerous the outside world seems to become. The towns. What for? <clears throat> Are wicked places where wicked people live. That's all. It's important to note here the distinction which Bauman makes from actual ghettoization, which is a process that only serves to marginalize and destroy communities. Critically, unlike members of an actual ghetto, members of a voluntary ghetto do have the freedom to leave. Even if that option feels impossible and supremely undesirable because of the perceived danger of the outside, it still exists. And moreover, whereas a real ghetto is designed to keep people confined in one space, a voluntary ghetto is designed to keep others out. Racism and xenophobia are the most potent forces towards actual ghettoization because it is fairly easy to place people into racial categories based on the way they look. If those categorizations are wrong or overgeneralized, it doesn't matter much to whoever is in power because they can shift the goalposts as needed. On that basis, creating a uniform gated community should be an easy task. We can see that process at work in many of the shots of the villagers which frame only their bodies and not their faces, reducing them to a homogenous mass. But this is a doomed project. It is impossible to excise all variation from a group of people and this makes the village unrelentingly cruel to those who do not conform. There are two characters with disabilities in the village. Ivy, who is blind, and Noah, who has a developmental disability that seems to resemble autism. These characters are also, overwhelmingly, the victims and perpetrators of violence. This project was not planned with them in mind. Even Noah's parents refuse to treat him with any dignity. They punish him for misbehaving by locking him in a room alone. Ivy and, to a lesser extent, Lucius are the only characters we see interact with Noah as an equal. When Lucius and Ivy become engaged, though, Noah is finally able to recognize that there is no place for him in this world. His attack on Lucius is not merely a crime of passion. He is also resisting Ivy's assimilation into the oppressive structures of the village, which distances her from him. The attack may be misdirected, after all, Lucius himself also struggles to fit in and be taken seriously, but Noah's not entirely off base here. Soon after the attack, Ivy comes into the room where he is being held. Her earlier empathy is gone. Ivy strikes Noah repeatedly, 
further and further distancing herself from his transgression and from their shared identity as the only disabled members of the community, driving both of them deeper into alienation and self-doubt. Later, not realizing it's him, Ivy kills Noah after he follows her through the woods dressed as one of the beasts fabricated by the elders. In doing so, Ivy is fully embracing the mythology that was created to keep her confined within the village and away from access to people and tools that could enrich her life. Unknowingly, she is also doing the work of the elders for them. Noah becomes the beast not only in his costume, but also in what he represents, which is a source of variation from the village's values, and therefore a source of uncontrolled violence that must be destroyed. Finally, once the perceived threat is neutralized, Ivy does leave the village, but she is compelled to return not only by her love for Lucius, but also because she can imagine no other alternative. Noah's and Ivy's fates present an interesting small-scale model of how minority communities have historically been dealt with by nationalism. Generally, there are two options available to minorities when a nation attempts to subsume them. Assimilate or be destroyed. Ivy assimilates and Noah is destroyed. In either case, their small community, their variation from the norm, dissolves. And I hope it's becoming clear now that the village is not so different from our modern world after all. Edward's idea for the village was simple. He gathered a good bunch of people with similar values who had been hurt by random acts of violence. They attempted to create a better world for themselves and their children by modeling their lifestyle after the late 19th century, which they saw as a time before things went sour. They created a mythology of grotesque beasts which, despite their fearsome appearance, served to make abstract anxieties more concrete and therefore more manageable. But this solution only superficially responds to violence, grief, and trauma. It fails because it is a community born not out of mutual respect and compassion, but out of fear and hatred of the other. This project does nothing to resolve the systemic causes of violence. It fails to alleviate any of the violence that is done to people on the basis of race or disability, because it fails to engage with the inequity that is at the root of many violent acts. Edward seems to recognize the potency of financial inequality as a force for violence when he explains to Ivy why they don't use money in the village. You do not know of money. It is not part of our life here. Money can be a wicked thing. It can turn men's hearts black, good men's hearts. So the village might appear to be a post-scarcity moneyless utopia, but it is still propped up by Edward's enormous wealth meaning its existence is still feeding into the capitalist system that created the conditions necessitating it. Meanwhile, even within its walls, the village has not truly eliminated violence. Just as the village has reproduced the systemic problems of racism and ableism, it has also reproduced the outside world's relationship to violence. Violence is a tool that the state and only the state uses to exert its power. In this case, the elders frighten the other villagers into submission with the threat of mutilation by terrible beasts. When Noah identifies violence as a potent force and tries to emulate them, the system is thrown into chaos and he must be violently punished and eventually subdued. Ultimately, the village begins and ends with preventable deaths. August's son dies due to the absence of modern medicine, and Noah dies because of Ivy's ignorance and her blindness, which is also implied to have been preventable. In both cases, the elders put the secrecy of their project ahead of the lives of their children. Edward asks Noah's parents to consider their son's death as a stroke of luck that will keep fear of the outside world alive. Your son has made our stories real.
Noah has given us a chance to continue this place. Noah's death is given meaning as part of the village's grand narrative, but the gesture is empty because he lived and died without dignity. His life is seen as disposable and sacrificial, and his parents must repress their emotions instead of allowing themselves to experience fully and honestly the pain and grief of losing a child. By rationalizing his death this way, they have also denied themselves the opportunity to avenge him by effecting real change and fighting for the rights of marginalized people. They instead resign themselves to the words of Noah's father. You may run from sorrow as we have. Sorrow will find you. Regardless of whether they're in the village or the outside world. Just before imagining the Angel of History, Walter Benjamin writes that the tradition of the oppressed teaches us that the state of emergency in which we live is not the exception, but the rule. That is to say, the catastrophe that perturbs the angel may be increasing in its scope, but no matter how far back you go, it has always been there. It is baked into the foundation of our collective history. So, the elders of the village were not wrong in identifying that the trajectory of so-called progress along the axis of time would continue to plunge us deeper into catastrophe. But their mistake was in thinking that they could undo the damage that had been done by traveling back along that same axis in the opposite direction. This is a futile effort, too. Our only hope, according to Benjamin, is to make the continuum of history explode. Not to turn around, but to turn away. To radically transform the axis into something entirely new. Not to set back the clock, but to smash the clock apart and build something our ancestors could never have dreamed of. I want to take some time now to talk about whether or not any of what I've discussed was intentional. Usually, I wouldn't be inclined to bother with this question because interpretation can be valid without author intention and it doesn't really matter one way or the other. But in this case, I found it difficult to ignore the rest of M. Night Shyamalan's canon when specifically approaching disability in the village. Honestly, I love M. Night Shyamalan's movies. I like his odd parable dialogue and the way he directs his actors to be as awkward and stilted as the audience can bear. I genuinely enjoy M. Night Shyamalan's earnest expressions of grief and the alienation it can lead to. I like saying M. Night Shyamalan, but I don't like the way that he treats disabled people in his movies, because he treats them as weapons. There are a couple of quick spoilers here, so skip ahead to this time if you don't want to hear it. In The Sixth Sense, the sole purpose of the character Vincent Gray, a mentally ill man, is to shoot Malcolm. In Unbreakable, Elijah Price's brittle bone disease motivates him to carry out multiple mass murders. And do I even need to talk about Split? Going by these characterizations alone, we might be led to believe that people with mental and physical disabilities are violent by nature. Sure, these characters also live in a society, and we could blame society for their acts of violence if we wanted to be generous. But I just don't see that in the texts the way that I do for the village. Printed from that same pattern, Noah just becomes another convenient tool to progress the plot lines of the able-bodied characters in the village through his acts of naive violence. I think in order to make sense of the village, it's helpful to ask whether the film is sympathetic to the titular conservative project of voluntary ghettoization. And in some ways, it is. This is perhaps felt most clearly when Edward gives an impassioned speech to the other elders about the hope and innocence upon which the village was founded. And that, in the end, is what we have protected here. Innocence! That I'm not ready to give up! And I don't think there's any irony here. The camera trembles as though it's quaking with emotion at Edward's words. 
On the other hand, there's something interesting in the original draft of the script, which was leaked before the movie was released. This draft has a slightly different ending, where a truck driver helps Ivy, then buys gas from an odd elderly couple who rip him off. This seems to hint at corruption in the outside world, but as the trucker drives off, he dismisses the couple with the movie's final line. Crazy fucking white people. And what better way to characterize the entire conceit of this film?